My name is Helene Slachter. I'm an associate professor of psychology at the University of Amsterdam. And today I'd like to tell you something about meditation as a method to enhance brain and mental functioning. But what is meditation? Uh, probably all of you have some idea of what meditation is. But there are many different styles of meditation. In fact, within each of the world religions, there are contemplative traditions <clears throat> within which different styles of meditation are being practiced. So today I want to talk to you about a style of uh, Buddhist meditation called open monitoring meditation. Uh, this is a bit of an umbrella term, but it includes, for example, mindfulness meditation that uh, probably some of you are familiar with. And in this style of meditation, the practitioner is attentive moment by moment to anything that occurs in experience, whether it be a sensation, a thought or a feeling, but without further elaboration. And thereby the style of meditation is called to cultivate a form of non-reactive awareness where one is simply registering what's happening um, but without reacting to it. And this way the practitioner is forced to gain insight, more insight into how his mind habitually responds to particular events um, and also learns to dissociate his reaction from um, particular thoughts and feelings, thereby gaining the ability to develop also novel and perhaps more healthy ways of responding. So when I was first described the style of meditation and asked about psychological tasks that may be sensitive for measuring the effects of open monitoring meditation, I immediately had to think about the attentional link task. Um, in this task, participants are shown a very rapid stream of stimuli, and most of these stimuli are non-target stimuli. Uh, in this example, they're the letters. But embedded in this rapid stream of non-targets are also two target stimuli, T1 and T2. In this example, they're the two numbers. And subjects are asked to identify these two targets, because at the end of each sequence they get two questions. What was the first target? What was the second target? Well, the striking thing is, whenever the second target follows the first one very quickly in time, within about half a second, subjects often fail to identify the second target. It is as if attention temporarily blinked and hence the term attentional link task. Let me show you a demonstration of a trial. You have to detect the two numbers and beware the stimuli come very fast. There we go. Okay, let me play that again. And just once more. So I don't know whether you saw them, but there were a 6 and a 3 embedded in the letter stream. Theories of the attentional blink um, generally agree that it results from competition between the different stimuli for limited attentional resources. Um, for example, in one influential account, it is postulated that when you over-allocate these limited resources to the encoding of the first target, you will not have enough of these resources available for the second target if it follows the first one very quickly in time and thereby you're less likely to actually see it. There's some support for these accounts uh, from event-related potential studies, ERP studies, that have shown that the first target is associated with a bigger P3B, a brain potential index of resource allocation, in trials where subjects subsequently blink to the second target versus the no-blink trials, the trials where they subsequently actually see the second target. Um, so this, this increase in P3B to the first target in the blink trials is in line with the idea that when you over-allocate limited processing resources, higher order processing resources to the first target, you're more likely to, um, to fail to identify the second target. So based on this literature, when I was asked what three months of intensive open monitoring meditation might do, uh, my prediction was that it should lead to a reduction in the size of the attentional link to the second target because it should be associated with reduced capture by the first target. And secondly, that this reduction in T1 capture should be reflected in a smaller T1 elicited P3B, this brain potential index of resource allocation. So in this three-month meditation study, there were actually three groups. There was a practitioner group who went into a three-month meditation retreat where they meditated for 10 to 12 hours per day. And we tested them twice, once before and once right after the retreat. And there was a control group uh, of individuals who was also interested in learning meditation and who got a little bit of meditation practice experience, but much, much less than the practitioner group. 
and we also tested the novices twice with a three-month period in between. So during these testing sessions, um, participants did an attentional link task while we measured their event-related potentials using EEG. The attentional link task was very similar to the one I just described, so subjects had to detect two numbers uh, among letters, and the second target could follow the first one after a short interval, after a short interval, so within the time window of the attentional link, or after a longer interval outside the time window of the attentional link. So our first prediction was that after three months of open monitoring meditation, the attentional link should become smaller, and this is indeed what we found. Here we see the behavioral data. Um, on the y-axis, you see the percentage of trials in which subjects actually saw the second target, and you can see at time one, which are the light gray bars, that both the novices and the practitioners show a reduced ability to see the second target in the short interval trials compared to the long interval trials. So this is your typical attentional link. At time two, both groups in both intervals show higher T2 accuracy, but uh, this is then just a mere practice effect. But strikingly, and in line with our prediction, the practitioners show a much bigger increase in their ability to see the second target in the short interval compared to the long interval trials and compared to the novices. So we indeed find that three months of open monitoring meditation is associated with a smaller attentional blink. Our next prediction was that this reduction in attentional blink size would be the result of reduced brain resource allocation to the first target. So for this, we looked at the event-related potentials um, that are displayed here separately for the novices on the left and for the practitioners on the right, for time one on top and for time two at the bottom, and separately for the blink trials, the black traces, and for the no blink trials, the green traces. Um, and it's a bit of a complex figure, but all the action is happening here at time two for the practitioners. As you can see, at time two, uh, the P3B to the first target is reduced in amplitude in those trials where subjects actually go on to see the second target in the no-blink trials, compared to the blink trials where they actually fail to see the second target. So in line with our prediction, we find a reduction in brain resource allocation to the first target in no-blink trials um, over time in the practitioner group only. Importantly, we also find a nice relationship between our behavioral neural measures, such that um, those individuals who showed the greatest reduction in brain resource allocation to the first in, uh, target, as indicated by uh, this reduced amplitude of the T1 elicit P3B, um, were also the ones who showed the biggest reduction in attentional blink size over time. So together, these data confirm that open monitoring meditation may reduce the propensity to get stuck on a stimulus, as indicated by this reduction in P3B amplitude, and thereby increase one's ability to attend to the content of experience from moment to moment, as indexed by this reduction in attentional link size. More generally, these findings suggest that purely mental training may change performance on an external task that calls upon the trained skills but does not require meditation itself. And that's obviously a very exciting finding in the context of cognitive therapies that are developed to treat uh, certain psychiatric conditions. Uh, with this, I come to the end of my talk, and I'd like to thank you for your attention.